Hi there, good morning. Uh, Ronan Furlong is my name. I'm the executive director of a thing called, a thing called uh, DCU Alpha. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Uh, just firstly to say thanks very much to uh, GMIT and Enterprise Ireland uh, and to Mark Bannon from uh, VT Networks for inviting me to be with you here this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about, uh, as the title slide says, the landscape, the trends, some of the business models, but I'm also going to put in, uh, seeing as it's a kind of a political day, I'm going to put in a, a little kind of thought about what we need to be, be doing as an economy and as a country and as a society if we are going to play effectively in this whole IoT uh, brave new world. So um, hopefully you'll get something out of this. I I'll be coming at it through the lens of uh, DCU Alpha and some of the stuff that we see regularly. Uh, I guess the follow-on speakers will be talking about their various different geographies and sectors and verticals within the whole IoT industry, but uh, I'll, I'll bring a, a specific DCU Alpha slant to this. Uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll get some inspiration and get some ideas and see what's going on in terms of the various different enterprises, startups, SMEs, and indeed multinationals who are really getting aggressive in the whole IoT space in an Irish context. So um, I better explain, first of all, what, what DCU Alpha is. I guess it would be safe to assume that most people in the room have heard of Dublin City University. Well, well, DCU Alpha is its innovation campus. It's about 800 meters away from the main university as the crow flies. It's the former Enterprise Ireland headquarters, and we have Enterprise Ireland and IDA people in the room who are probably well familiar with the site in its heyday as uh, EI's uh, main headquarters. And it's been in existence since the mid-1940s as the place where Ireland Inc. Uh, and the Irish kind of industrial research community used to test the things. Uh, the things back then were things like timber furniture or steel. Uh, obviously now, if, if anyone's ever been in the main building, you'll see a, a carpet by, uh, I think, Vjoy's Carpets in Donegal that was commissioned back in the 1980s, which shows a huge tapestry of uh, industrial revolution motifs of cogs, pulleys, gears, and pistons. Uh, we'd be planning to create a new carpet uh, in maybe a couple of years' time, which will reflect the next generation of technologies of robotics and LEDs and sensors, etc. And I guess that's a kind of, uh, that's redolent of what we're doing with the former Enterprise Ireland campus. We're repurposing it from what it was and what it did uh, to a new innovation hub for this next generation of technology, specifically around the whole area of the Internet of Things. Um, so that's what DCU Alpha is. And back to a point made earlier about uh, Dublin filling up fast on the office side. Uh, that's having a real direct knock-on effect on us because startup companies just cannot get space in the city centre. It's a real landlord's market at the moment, and three-year-old companies are being asked to sign 15-year leases. That kind of stuff doesn't compute. It's like, I guess, asking for uh, you know, a, a toddler to take out a pension. It, it doesn't stack up. So places like DCU Alpha and GMIT and various other sort of third-level connected and co-located innovation hubs are really going to be important in the next couple of years in terms of supporting that nascent innovation activity that's happening and bubbling away and supported by Enterprise Ireland, specifically in the IoT sector. So uh, what happens in DCU Alpha? Well, there's about 40 companies based there at the moment, and I guess all of them are focused on making or managing things. So this is quite an interesting flavor, specifically in a Dublin context, which is seen as this kind of internet capital of Europe. Uh, so there's quite a lot of activity in Dublin around software as a service and the app economy and uh, digital business generally. Uh, but really and truly, the internet of things is going to dwarf that activity over the coming decade. Um, really, the, the world of connected hardware is going to be 10 times as big as the internet as far as I'm concerned. So there's a big opportunity for Ireland Inc. Uh, and various different hub locations within Ireland to, to play effectively in this space. But as you're all familiar here, you know, the internet of things is about basically everything and the trillions of devices and the, oh, sorry, the trillions of dollars of value and the billions of devices uh, that are going to be created as a result of this. So all of the companies in DCU Alpha would, would bridge that physical and digital divide and, and make or manage a thing that is tangible and physical and operating in the real world, which is obviously connected back into the internet to add value to their business model and their customers, but ultimately it's about hardware in my view. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about what that means uh, in terms of the companies we're seeing and in terms of the technologies we're seeing. Uh, so, so there's a kind of a quick flavor of the companies who are based in DCU Alpha. 
Uh, as I mentioned, they all make or manage a thing. Uh, and you've got some sort of household names there like Siemens and Veolia and Fujitsu that you're all well familiar with. Siemens are a great anchor tenant for us. Uh, the, the Siemens Ireland HQ is in DCU Alpha now, so their wind energy business, their ICT business, their industrial automation business is all based on our campus. And from, a, from an anchor tenant, you couldn't get more than, you know, you couldn't get better than Siemens. They make all the things, from dishwashers to wind turbines and everything in between. And increasingly, all those things that they make are, are getting instrumented and interconnected and intelligent and are becoming part of that wider industrial internet of things uh, where specifically their focus. Um, on the other end of the spectrum from someone like Siemens, you've got um, a company like KL Technologies, which is uh, an Enterprise Ireland client, uh, went through an innovation voucher, is now in the competitive start fund arena, who are developing a wearable collar for calves. Uh, very early stage startup, uh, came from one of our hackathons actually, uh, and are working with the university to develop their technology, and I'll explain a bit more about that a little bit later. Um, there's some companies in here that, um, before they arrived on our doorstep, I'd never heard of them, but they turn out to be huge companies. So the company over on the left-hand side of the screen there, halfway down, uh, VSP Global, was the biggest company I'd never heard of. Um, they're probably the largest insurer in the world in, terms of in, in volume terms. They have 80 million customers who use their product, and uh, those 80 million customers all have insurance in terms of using that product. And that product is something that's sitting on a lot of people's faces in the rooms today, it's, it's a pair of glasses. What in God's name does a pair of glasses have to do with the Internet of Things? And I'll explain a little bit about that as we go forward as well. Uh, so look, I won't go through all of those. I'm going to give you some examples of the kind of thing and the kind of activity that these companies are involved in in DCU Alpha. And it'll give you a flavor of how vibrant and how rich and how broad the spectrum of activity is in IoT in an Irish context. Uh, I'm going to talk about the landscape uh, through, through the lens of this particular graphic and also through the lens of DCU Alpha. It's probably not particularly easy to read there, but I'm, I'm focusing on the top layer of this diagram. Uh, down at the bottom, you, the individual, the user, the person with the smartphone, um, you're obviously connecting via the cloud uh, across the World Wide Web into a particular location or environment like a hospital or a power network or whatever the case may be. DCU Alpha is focused on the level above that. Again, it's focused on the companies that actually make the things that are ultimately deployed in the world of the Internet of Things. Uh, so just to give you a few examples, uh, KL Tech, uh, as I mentioned, an Enterprise Ireland company, very early stage startup, working with the university to develop a wearable collar for calves to manage, uh, believe it or not, the weaning process. So, so think of the Internet of Cows, if you like. Um, this... This team, this team competed in a hackathon in DCU Alpha on a, on, a, on a weekend, incorporated the company the following Tuesday, and moved into one of our facilities on a Thursday afternoon. That's how quickly this stuff can happen. You no longer have to be a GE or a Ford to start a hardware company. You can get up and running very quickly. Uh, this technology essentially manages the weaning process for, for, for calves in the dairy sector. Why does that need to be managed? So the way it works at the moment is that the, the calf is separated from the mother. Very logical approach. They're put in separate fields. And in theory, the weaning stops and uh, everyone grows up overnight. Not the way it happens in reality. Uh, serious separation anxiety from the mother's perspective. She stops yielding milk. Real stress and anxiety from the calf's perspective who starts losing weight. Uh, you multiply that over thousands and thousands of heads of cattle and it becomes a real economic problem. So what this uh, collar does is essentially through accelerometers and magnetometers and all sorts of whiz-bang technology embedded in the physical device <clears throat> can detect the gait of the calf, can detect the tilt of its head, can detect the suckling motion that it's about to engage in, knows through the RFID tag in the mother's ear where she is so it can recognize an event and essentially gives the calf an electric shock. That sounds a bit cruel, but it's no more than what they'd get if they brushed up against an electric fence on a farm. So very quickly, the calf, without any stress or any anxiety, becomes conditioned to believe that this suckling stuff is no longer a good idea. <clears throat> so, so think of Pavlov's cow or something like that. <clears throat> very clever technology, uh, very small company, uh, came out of one of the IoT hackathons that we ran, working with the university, partnering with Enterprise Ireland, 
all of a sudden Ireland has a potential really interesting agri-tech hardware company operating in the Internet of Things for very little effort, uh, apart from the deployment of skills and expertise of the founders. So that's one interesting example. The next one is a, a company called New Wave, who are, um, as their strap line says, the Internet of Things for air quality. What's really interesting about this company is it's, it's kind of changed the sort of manufacturing paradigm, or, or it's, it's participating in a revolution in manufacturing, if you like. This is a six-person company, again, based in, in one of our offices, one of our workshops in DCU Alpha. Um, what's curious about this company is it's designing, 3D printing, hand finishing, packaging, and shipping to real paying customers this device, this technology. It's a six-person manufacturing company, end-to-end -end integrated, something you couldn't possibly have imagined a number of years ago. So through the advent of things like uh, crowdfunding, access to cheap additive manufacturing capability, the ability on e-commerce platforms to sell directly to the customers uh, worldwide, as it happens, uh, the, the, the hurdles, the barriers to starting an Internet of Things company are, are, are getting lower and lower. Uh, and you're going to see an awful lot of activity in this space, the startup space, by IoT companies in an Irish context because it's very, very much quicker and easier to start a hardware, a connected hardware IoT company in this space. So this is an interesting product, um, huge applications. They're focusing on the, the, the consumer residential market in the short term where this device can detect uh, particles and pathogens in the air whether it be for deployment in a creche, so you know why not to send little Johnny into the creche because there's kids in there with rivers of green coming out of their noses. Uh, or you know, for example, uh, an asthma sufferer, you know, what the air quality in the room is like from their perspective in terms of comfort, etc. So, uh, next example, uh, Smartbin. Smartbin are in the room, actually. I saw Seamus David earlier. Uh, and Smartbin described themselves as the internet of trash, uh, which is an interesting description. Uh, so it, it's, a, it's a fill level sensor technology that can detect within a, a container or a receptacle, a bin, what the actual level of waste, whether that be um, uh, recyclable clothes or waste oil or municipal rubbish, it can detect uh, what the exact level of fill in each bin is. So it can, you know, obviously you can have uses like it can route the trucks to the appropriate locations, it can manage the waste collection process, it can optimize uh, the collection and, and, and emptying of the various different bins. Uh, so again, the Internet of Things is impacting every single sector you can possibly imagine. Again, based in DCU Alpha, uh, started out I think in, in Swords and moved in with us again to work with some of the community of companies that are there and get access to some of the technology and some of the kind of synergies that would exist between, uh, you know, a sensor-led company and a networks company or get access to talent or whatever the case may be. So actually this is the world's uh, smartest and most widely deployed fill level sensor. I think the metric I heard from um, Brendan yesterday was that there's 10,000 of these things dotted all around the world. I think they're in 25 countries. Again, a small enough company but with a huge future by virtue of playing in a really, really lucrative sector. Machine-to-machine um, -machine communications. So how do all of these things talk to each other? Well, we've got a company who just recently opened in DCU Alpha called Neosphere, who, which is a spin-out of a company that some of you may be more familiar with, a company called Tauglass from Enniscorthy. So Tauglass is a global leading uh, antenna company for machine-to-machine -machine communications based out of Enniscorthy. So, so you don't have to be in Silicon Valley, you don't have to be in Taiwan to be a world leader in IoT, machine-to-machine -machine communications. And they've spun out a new uh, sister company called Neosphere that is going to be delivering these Wi-Fi machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications technologies. So when you're next on an airplane or a train or a bus and you're on your Wi-Fi, you can thank people like uh, Neosphere and Tauglass in terms of delivering the radio antenna technology that can allow those communications. And increasingly, as more and more devices and things get connected to the networks, uh, how they communicate with each other, what kind of levels of power they use, uh, how they push and parse data in the cloud is going to be increasingly important. So as well as things companies that make the antennas, the whole area of networks and interoperability and communications and machine-to-machine -machine activity is going to be a big part of this uh, brave new world of IoT. 
Uh, another company based here in DCU Alpha uh, called Ambisense, uh, essentially a spin out of DCU. So wireless gas sensing network technology, an autonomous edge device that can be deployed in a low power environment and essentially monitor and manage environmental conditions uh, on something like a waste fill or a municipal dump or whatever the case may be to, to, to essentially track the hot spots of activity in terms of methane or something like that from a from a, a landfill. So you can imagine it being used as a, as a mining technology to allow you know, utility companies to figure out where the sweet spot or the hot spot is in the methane uh, deposit within a, wa a waste landfill. But also from a municipal environmental monitoring perspective, really interesting devices powered by solar PV, deployed out in the field, uh, monitored remotely, very interesting dynamic going on in terms of how all of these devices get pushed out to the edge and get communicated back remotely to, to the various different people who have to manage them. Um, VSP Global, I, me I mentioned this at the start. This is, uh, as I mentioned, the biggest company I'd never heard of. They, they come from Sacramento. They came into Ireland via the IDA, uh, the IDA's sister organization, Connect Ireland. And um, they essentially, for the last 80 years, have been manufacturing eyewear. And they realized that they had sold so many pairs of glasses that they, first of all, should develop an insurance company along the lines of a VHI to insure people's glasses. And that's why I mentioned they've got about 80 million customers in their insurance business, which is actually the biggest in the world, even though they're not an insurance company. Uh, what they've done since actually is, is more interesting. Uh, they've realized that to sell glasses, they're selling them through the optometrist, optometrist network. Uh, and they've also now spun out a software division to become the sort of SAP for the optometrists of the world. Uh, so a really interesting company that continually disrupts itself, but the next disruption is going to be the biggest. They've launched a division called The Shop, uh, not to be confused with Tech Shop, which I'm going to mention later on, but this division called The Shop is essentially a skunk works for this company to disrupt the eyewear and eye care business because their attitude is, if we don't do it, someone else like you guys in the room will do it for them. So they've brought together uh, fashion designers, uh, hardware engineers, um, sensor tech people, software developers, branding people, etc. brought them into this melting pot where they, they look at the future of eyewear and eye care. And some of the stuff they're coming up with is really, really astonishing. Um, so if you can see this pair of glasses in the armature, there's so much technology capable of being embedded in that piece of hardware now that is getting really, really interesting. So magnetometers, accelerometers, all sorts of capabilities in a pair of glasses. And crit critically in a pair of glasses, uh, first of all, the device, the actual electronics device is sitting on your temple, which is a great location for EEG and ECG data. More importantly, the glasses are things that you put on first thing in the morning and you take, on last thing, take off last thing at night when you're going to sleep. So it's not like a Fitbit where you decide, oh, I'm kind of a little bit uncomfortable, I'm going to take that off and leave it over there and forget about it. Glasses are a really interesting wearable. They're the most accepted and, I guess, oldest form of wearable technology, if you like. So uh, these are the company that developed the prescription lenses for Google Glass. And they're based in Ireland. They're very low profile at the moment, but you're going to hear a lot about them in, in the years to come. But whereas Google Glass was a technology that looked out and captured other people's data in, in a sort of pervasive fashion, these guys feel the killer app for wearable technology and glasses is actually looking back in. So if you think about a pair of glasses, the lens is sitting in front of your eye, which is connected to your optical nerve, which is a portal to your entire nervous system. So imagine the health applications for the internet of eyewear, if you like. Uh, so the way they describe this thing called Project Genesis is if you imagine you put on a pair of glasses in the morning and it tells you something straight away like you've got early onset dementia. Now, <laughs> so it's getting interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, so that's not the kind of thing you want to hear first thing in the morning, but it's the kind of thing worth knowing if it's happening to you. Uh, so, you know, imagine a complete health check every time you put on your pair of glasses in the morning. That's, that's where this kind of stuff is going. Uh, so, you're going to hear a lot about this kind of technology, and you've already seen it in, in movies like uh, Mission Impossible already. So, that's the kind of thing that's coming down the track on the internet of eyewear. Um, as I mentioned, Siemens are in our place uh, doing very interesting things around industrial automation. Uh, obviously, particularly their wind energy business. Wind farms are re located remotely. Uh, they're hard to get to, they're hard to maintain, they're hard to service. Uh, so 
the whole area of predictive maintenance and the algorithms and the management and the maintenance and the monitoring of wind farms is a very interesting thing for Siemens through this IoT uh, lens, if you like. So looking at networks, looking at drone technology, looking at management systems that can take care of very expensive hardware in very um, remote and, I guess, hazardous locations. So that's the kind of activity they're involved in on, on the IoT side in, in DCU Alpha. Uh, Shimmer. Shimmer is an interesting one. I'm not, I'm not sure how many people have heard about Shimmer, but when you see Wales against France tonight, uh, or Ireland against England tomorrow, and you notice the little square thing in between the shoulder blades of the players that's stitched into the jersey, that's what that is. That's a, that's a thing called Shimmer. And it's a biometric and biophysical wearable technology uh, for managing elite athlete performance. So uh, designed and prototyped in DCU Alpha, manufactured not in Shenzhen or in Mexico or in Taiwan, manufactured in Santry. So I didn't know there was a pick and place robotics factory in Santry until I saw it. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. But uh, the ability for IoT to be onshored in terms of manufacturing is interesting. It doesn't all have to go to China. Uh, the low volume stuff, the sort of high value stuff can be, can be manufactured locally. And that's an interesting economic opportunity as well. So all sorts of capability in that. Uh, I better get a move on here, sorry. So uh, IoT trends, very quickly, I won't dwell on this slide. What are the kind of key areas that the venture capitalists are funding at the moment? Uh, you've heard of some of them already. Connected homes, smart cities, wearable technology, connected cars is going to be a big one. So it's a real opportunity across a broad range of industrial sectors for IoT innovation. Um, as I mentioned at the start, I personally believe that IoT and connected hardware is going to be 10 times the size of the internet. We ain't seen nothing yet. All we've done to date, as Philip Moyna from Intel would say, is connect the screens. When we start connecting the things, there's going to be real, real economic impact. So getting slightly political for a second, um, the internet piece of the internet of things I think is really well serviced. I'm not sure if the things piece of the Internet of Things in Ireland is particularly well serviced. And I think we have a journey to travel on in respect of that. So there's muni municipal offerings in terms of um, you know, space, there's corporate champions, there's, there's accelerators, there's a government focus, there's a research capability around the Internet piece of this conversation. I'm not sure if the same level of capability and focus exists on the things part of this equation. And I'm going to delve into that very quickly. There's Ronan Harrison Google, where the data capital of Europe Fantastic, that is brilliant, but that should not be an end, that should be the beginning of something. And the beginning of things is really getting interesting. When you see what PCH have done with L'Oreal at CES in Las Vegas in January, this is a beauty and cosmetics company that have overnight turned themselves into a tech company by developing, with Liam Casey and PCH, a wearable UV sensor uh, that's worn on the skin. So the message here is that the things companies are waking up to the fact that they don't necessarily need the internet companies to be internet of things companies. That's a real fundamental paradigm shift from the industrial landscape and you're going to see more and more of it. So how can we make sure that we can innovate across bits and atoms as opposed to the focus we've had to date on just bits or, or more so on bits? So there's three areas. Hackathons, which I think are great for conceiving the ideas, uh, a commercial maker space, where those ideas can be prototyped rapidly, and ultimately a hardware and an IoT accelerator along the lines of Highway 1 in San Francisco. We have a myriad of incubators and accelerators in Ireland. None of them are specific to hardware. There's one just launched recently for IoT in the Ryan Academy, but again, it's a virtual accelerator. It doesn't bring the companies together in a space where they can prototype and actually manufacture the devices. There's a device that came out of our very first hackathon James Foody has just recently won the Young Business Entrepreneur of the Year Award. This is a wearable fertility tracking device uh, that went through our hackathon process, ultimately went to San Francisco and through the PCH Highway 1 Accelerator, and is now actively selling product into the market. Uh, Dacry Augmented Reality Technology, I won't say much about this, but this is indistinguishable from magic. I recommend you all go and have a look at this. <laughs> and there's the, the Internet of beef hackathon that we ran with ABP Food Group and Intel. Uh, and that was looking at how the IoT revolution would impact the beef industry. And some astonishing things came out of that, not least of which was KL Technologies, which is actively working away in the space at the, in the DCU Alpha space at the moment. 
Uh, I won't dwell too much on tech shop, I'll talk to you guys afterwards, but Ireland needs a tech shop. Ireland needs a place where entrepreneurs like yourselves can actually prototype and deliver a minimum viable prototype into the market that is IoT focused. Uh, the President of the US is all over tech shop and all over the maker movement in the US to try and reimagine and rebuild American manufacturing and it's something we could really avail of in an Irish context. There's the hardware incubator in PCH in San Francisco. Uh, and here's the message. Ireland wins at the internet, really good at data, really good at network research, has a fantastic burgeoning startup sector thanks to uh, Enterprise Ireland. But potentially, we need to be doing more for entrepreneurs in the field of providing accelerators and makerspaces that are specific to connected hardware and IoT. We need to help the people in the room here today to make the things. And I'm going to leave you with this slide. And I wonder, does anyone know what this is? This company IPO'd before Christmas for $5 billion in the US. Their first three prototypes of their technology were developed in Tech Shop in San Francisco. This is the first three prototypes of Square, the peer-to-peer -peer card reader uh, that came out of Tech Shop. And that's the kind of facility that we need to give people to get to the point where they can actually manufacture a prototype and go to VCs, show them that it works, because ultimately, a minimum viable prototype in IoT is worth a million slides. Thanks very much.